please give a warm LSC welcome to Dr. Phil Plate. Oh. Howdy, thank you. There we go. Oh, look, I'm huge in New Jersey. <laughs> okay. Um, so, I am an astronomer, and uh, I take my telescope out a lot and on the street and show people things through the, through the scope, Jupiter and the moon and things like that. And a lot of the times, uh, especially when I show people Hubble pictures on the web and, or now JWST pictures, they ask me, uh, first of all, how are you just so amazing at what you do? And I'm like, well, you know, um, that's, that's a joke. It's okay. You can feel free to laugh at everything I say. It's all right. I won't be offended. Um, but then they ask me, is that what this thing would really look like if I were there? And the answer to that is uh, complicated, typically. Sometimes the answer is yes, but more often the answer is no. And it occurred to me, this is something I should probably write about and talk about. So I wrote, uh, I wrote a book about it, basically saying what it, would, what it would be like to actually be at these places that you read about or, or see news items about all the time. Now, picking them was fun. Uh, the moon was an easy one. Mars was obvious enough. But which one... Uh, when I get asked about this too, is my favorite. Well, that's what I'm going to be talking about tonight. Because when I was about five years old, my folks bought some crappy department store telescope and set it up in the driveway and pointed it at Saturn. And I looked through that eyepiece and I was hooked. I knew at, at like five years old that I was going to be doing this for the rest of my life. And you know, in 50 years, I bet I'll be in New Jersey talking about this. And it turns out I was right. I was a really precocious kid. So, here we go. Ah, excellent. Here we go. Let the sun set. Let the stars come out. Now, when you go outside at night and you see the stars, they seem fixed in the sky. I mean, they rise and set. But over years, over decades, even centuries, they don't seem to move much, and they really don't, not by eye. But there are some stars that do, and we call them planets after the ancient Greeks. They call them plan planetes, something like that. I'm not an ancient Greek, so I don't really know how to pronounce it. Um, but we, we, that's the word we use. Now, planets, which means literally wanderers, because as they orbit the sun, they appear to move in the sky relative to the fixed stars. And the farthest of these that you can reliably see is Saturn. So it's been known since antiquity. You can see it with your naked eye. It's actually up in the evening um, opposite the sun. It, it's up uh, uh, right now in the sky. And uh, it's easily visible to the naked eye. It's a sort of a yellowish dot. It just looks like a, a, little, a little star in the sky. But if you put a telescope on it, a small telescope, you can actually see that it's not like other planets. And even Galileo noticed this, that it had these bumps on either side. And uh, he called them ears, Saturn's ears, which I, I kind of like, um, because they're kind of like ears sticking out. As telescopes got better, we started to see that these aren't just bumps on either side of the planet, that this is some sort of ring going around it, and it doesn't touch the planet anywhere. And right away, that tells you a lot about what these things are, because they can't be solid. If they were solid, then um, they would break apart because one of the things about gravity is that if you're closer to an object that you're orbiting, you're going to be moving faster around it than something farther away. And so if the inner side of the ring, the inner part of the ring closer to the planet is whipping around the planet faster than the outer side, if this thing was solid and made out of rock or something, it would basically tear itself apart. So it can't be solid. It must be, well, maybe liquid. That was one idea. And then they realized, no, it's actually made up of ice particles, chunks of ice. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here, but that's, that's kind of what you see with Saturn through a small telescope. It doesn't look all that great. But if you see it through a bigger telescope, it looks like this. A lovely shot of Saturn. Now, for this evening, I want you to imagine, and I imagine the alcohol will help here, that you have booked passage on a spaceship, a luxury liner, a cruise ship that's taken you to Saturn. And we're approaching this magnificent planet. 
from several million kilometers out. I'm sorry I use metric. I can convert to imperial or whatever if you need me to. Um, but as we're approaching the planet, we're going to see different things. And the captain, being an intelligent person, is going to swing by several of the moons, and then we're going to go to the rings and then see the planet itself. And I have been hired to be your esteemed tour guide on this vacation to Saturn. So, look at that. It's like I know what I'm doing. Perfect. The first thing you'll see on your way in are some of the weird moons orbiting this planet. Now, Earth only has one, one moon, and it's decent-sized, and you're familiar with it. You see it in the sky all the time. Saturn has 145 moons and counting, down to little dinky ones, which are less than a kilometer across. They're, they're basically hills, you know, if, if bigger moons or mountains are bigger. Some of them are quite small, but a lot of them are pretty big. And one of the most distant ones is called Iapetus. And these are all, the moons are all named after uh, stories, uh, characters involved with Saturn in Greek myths. And Iapetus is one of them. And this is a pretty weird moon. My heavens, look how big that is from down here. Wow, super cool. This moon is mostly made of rock and ice, and it's covered in craters. That's to be expected. If you have something that's sitting out in the solar system for a couple of billion years, it's going to get whacked by asteroids and comets and things like that. And it's got that honking big crater there on the lower left. And that's going to be a recurring theme in some of the moons I'll be showing you as we, as we pass by them on our cruise ship. Iapetus has a lot of weird stuff going on about it, but one of the weirdest things, besides the fact that it's got this uh, big dark spot that actually covers almost the entire hemisphere on the other side of it, but if you, if you look over on the right, it's got this uh, little pimple, a little, little bump, a wart, a thing. What is that? <laughs> what is that indeed? Here's another shot of Iapetus that gives you a better idea of what it is. It's a ridge that goes all the way around the moon. This is a walnut moon. Look at it. It's a walnut. It's a space walnut. I wouldn't suggest eating it, though. It'll hurt your tongue. It's very cold out by Saturn. But of all the things to see on a moon, you know, we expect craters. We expect weird colors. We expect strange formations. What we don't expect is a ridge going all the way around the equator of that moon. What is this? It's like a mountain range. And some of these mountains are pretty high, 20 kilometers or so, which is much taller than Mount Everest. Much taller, actually. Um, and uh, it's, it's about er, 20 or 30 kilometers wide at the base. So this thing is pretty big. Here's another view of it from up close at an angle as we approach this moon and fly over it. Look at that. What is that? Well, it's the only thing seen like it in the entire solar system. So it's not something that happens a lot. So whatever happened to this moon must have been something unusual. One idea is that as it was cooling, when after it first formed and it was still warm, it was spinning rapidly. And as it cooled and shrank, the crust kind of bulged up at the equator and formed this. But it turns out that doesn't really work very well. And another big idea is that at some point in the past, Iapetus got whacked hard by maybe another moon, something really big. It came in, collided with it, blasted material out into space, and that material would have collapsed down into a ring of particles, which I kind of like that idea because you have a moon with a ring orbiting a planet with rings. That would have been super cool to see. And then eventually, uh, due to the, the, the basically it's a, a torque that, that Saturn's gravity yanks on that moon, that ring would have collapsed down and formed this ridge. Now, of course, on our fancy spaceship in the year 2217, sure. Uh, we already know, of course, the answer to this, but I won't, I won't insult you with, with telling you what it really is. You all know it'll be in the guidebook. Hmm, hang on, try that again. There we go. Now, as we approach Saturn, and we're approaching in the plane of the rings, the rings are very flat. And we're, we've come in at an angle and then pulled over the equator of Saturn. And we see that the rings are actually incredibly thin. And this is something that surprises people. The rings are immense side to side. From one end to the other is about 270,000 kilometers. To give you a sense of scale, that's about two-thirds of the distance from the Earth to the moon. 
So if you had the Earth here and the Moon here, Saturn would fill two-thirds of that gap, the rings would. They are a huge structure, but they're flat, really flat. Despite being you know, a quarter of a million kilometers across, they're only at some places 10 meters thick. So in other words, you could be at the bottom of the rings here, and the top would not even reach to the, to the, to the ceiling of this observation deck on our lovely cruise ship. Uh, and that's amazing. How can they be that thin? They're thinner in scale than a piece of paper. If you took a piece of paper and scaled it up to the size of Saturn, Saturn's rings at least, it would be thicker than those rings. And it turns out this is all natural. Of course, it's all natural, but it's due to gravity. As something, uh, the idea now being is that uh, a couple of moons collided, icy moons, slammed into each other early on. Uh, we're not exactly sure when, but there's some indication that the rings are a little bit young, maybe only 100 million years old. And these two moons slammed into each other, blasted apart into zillions of little particles, and then Saturn's gravity would have torqued them and pulled them over its equator and flattened them out. These particles would also bump into each other constantly. So if one of them was in a sort of slightly tilted orbit around Saturn, it would whack into another one at a different angle. And over time, that would all average out and would flatten them out and be in the plane of Saturn's uh, equator. And that's why they're so flat. There's something else unusual about this picture. And it's kind of, might be hard to tell here, but it's not a circle. It's wider through the equator than it is through the poles. That's not an illusion. It's about 10% wider through the equator. Why? Well, for one thing, it spins really fast. Okay, This is a big planet. It's about 10 times the diameter of Earth. So Earth would be, oh, this is, uh, by the way, this is the moon Titan, which we'll be seeing in a moment. That's the shadow of Titan on the planet. Titan is roughly a third to a half of Earth's diameter. So that shadow on, on, on Saturn is not that much smaller than how big Earth would appear if you compared it to this planet. Ten times wider than the Earth, but it spins in about 10 hours, over twice as fast as Earth. And that means that if you were on its equator, you would feel a pretty serious centrifugal force, that force outwards that you know, keeps you plastered against the wall of, of one of those carnival rides that you're, you, you're betting your life on won't come flying off when, when you're riding on it. Or when you're driving in a car and you turn the wheel to the right, you feel a, a force pushing you to the left. That's centrifugal force. It's a real force. Don't let people tell you it's fictitious. That's not true. It's real. And uh, that's what's pushing Saturn's equator out. It's spinning rapidly. And so there's this force at the equator that bulges it out. Not only that, Saturn is very low density. Now, Earth has a density of about five times that of water. And that tells you kind of a little bit about what it's made of. Things that are that dense tend to be a mixture of metal and rock. They're very dense. And if you put them in water, they don't float. They sink right down to the bottom, right? They're denser than water. When you calculate Saturn's density, even though it's huge, it's 10 times wider than Earth and about 100 times Earth's mass, which is a lot, it's very low density. It's actually less dense than water. So if you could put Saturn in a gigantic bathtub filled with water, it would float, but it would leave a ring. <laughs> well, you all need to drink more. Um, I'll, I'll wait if you want to go out to the bar again. That'd be great. Um, sorry, that's the, that is the level of my humor. So this is a weird planet. It's very much not like Earth with a retinue of moons that are very much not like Earth. And yet, and yet, a running theme here will be how similar some of the things are that we'll be seeing. To wit, that's a little bit of a closer view of Titan. This is a moon that is very, very large. It's aptly named. It's over, it's over 5,000 kilometers wide. That makes it second largest in the solar system, second only to Ganymede, which is a moon of Jupiter. But that's also bigger than the planet Mercury. So if Titan were out there and Saturn weren't, if Titan were just orbiting the sun out there, we'd be tempted to call it a planet in its own right. Now you'll notice you don't see any craters on it, and that's because it has an atmosphere, a thick atmosphere. Even though the gravity on the surface is lower than Earth's, it has such a thick atmosphere that if you were standing on the surface of Titan, well, you'd, you'd die, uh, for one thing. It's really cold there. We're talking about 
Um, it's 10 times farther out from the sun than the earth is. So it only gets 1% of the sunlight. So it's very, very cold there. Um, so that's one way it would kill you. But its atmosphere is uh, denser than earth's. So if you were standing there, it would actually, there would actually be more air around you than there, than there would be standing on earth. Also, the atmosphere is mostly nitrogen. Our atmosphere is mostly nitrogen. So that's a similarity to Earth. It's different because it's very cold. The gravity is lower. There's also weird things in the atmosphere there like methane and other stuff like that. So it's not like Earth's atmosphere. You couldn't breathe it even if it were warmed up. But still, it's interesting that it has a thick atmosphere and it's made up of the same sort of stuff that Earth's is. Now, as we approach Titan, that was the reason in fact, that the atmosphere, that the planet itself, the moon, excuse me, the moon, I want to call it a planet, that the moon itself looks orange and fuzzy. That atmosphere is opaque. It's got a lot of haze in it, a lot of stuff suspended in it that makes it opaque to visible light. But if you use infrared light, which can penetrate that kind of stuff, and you look at Titan that way, you start to see surface features, these broad, dark features here. Those are dunes. But they're not sand dunes like you expect on Earth. Sand is like a glassy material that's broken up. This, these are actually hydrocarbons. It's actually a complex molecules of carbon and hydrogen that make up the rocks that are on the surface of Titan. And because it has an atmosphere, there's wind. And that erodes these things over time. And eventually, you get little tiny particles of carbohydrates, uh, carbohydrates, hydrocarbons. You don't want to mix those up. Um, you know, you can have a sandwich with bread and not like gasoline. That's the difference between carbohydrates and hydrocarbons. So um, I should be a little more careful there. So these hydrocarbons on the surface break up, they form these grains, and then the wind blows them into dunes. And you can't see the dunes here, but that's what those are. Those are big dune fields. And if you look at them up close, it looks a lot like dune fields and deserts on Earth. That's not the only weird thing. Although, I mean, that's similar to Earth, but it's weird because of this, the situation. You can also use radar to penetrate this atmosphere. And just like a cop will use a radar gun to make sure when you're in your, in your flying car and, and they make sure you're not speeding through some school zone or something like that, you can use radar to penetrate this atmosphere, bounce it off the surface, and get sort of the topography of the surface. You can tell if there's a mountain versus a valley because that radar hits the top of the mountain and reflects back up to you. It doesn't have to travel as far, so the time it takes to get down there and back is short. If it goes down into a valley and bounces back up, it has to travel farther and it takes a little bit longer. So if you can measure those, that timing, those pulses of, of radar, you can actually make a map, a, topograph a, a topological map of the surface. That's pretty cool. You can see there are hills and valleys and mountains and things like that and plains on Titan. But also when, when you look at the North Pole with radar, what you see is this. That's weird. These are all hills. You can kind of see there are, it's a, you know, a hilly structure there. It's all hills and valleys and things. And then there's this, all this black stuff, as if it's like saying, no, you can't use your radar there. Radar doesn't get reflected by this stuff. That's why it's black. It's absorbing all that, all that radar, and it's not getting back, and so you can't see anything. What absorbs radar? And it turns out the answer is liquid. Liquid absorbs radar. If you beam a radar at liquid, it just gets sucked down. It doesn't come back at you. So this is some sort of liquid on the surface of Titan. This is the only other body in the solar system besides Earth that we know of that has liquid. But it's way too cold to be water. So what is it? And it turns out it's methane and ethane, two, uh, two um, molecules that are typically a gas on Earth where it's warm. But out by Titan where it's so cold, they can liquefy. But it's it's better than this. It's better than this. You know about the water cycle on Earth, right? You have the ocean, which is made of water, and it warms up, and so you get water vapor that rises up as it evaporates and forms clouds, and then those blow over the mountains, and then it rains or snows out, and that flows down the mountains in creeks, and then those creeks merge together to form rivers, and then the rivers flow in to form lakes, and then it evaporates again, and the whole process starts over again. That's the water cycle. That's important for life because it transports water from one place to another where it might not be that wet. So that's good. Uh, also, it helps mix up chemicals and things so that if you have, like, say, a lake that has a lot of interesting chemicals in it and, and you, you, you have an energy source, which is 
whatever little tiny bit of warmth from the sun there is, those molecules can start to break apart and reform and get more and more complex. And we think, in a sense, that's how life arose on Earth. So we're having the same thing here on Titan. You have these lakes of methane and ethane, and they evaporate out, and then it rains or snows on the mountains of Titan. And then that water up here, or excuse me, that methane up here, flows down into these little creeks which merge together into tributaries, and then they get into these rivers and they flow into the lake. Titan has a water cycle, except it's methane. And it gets better. I mean, that's like Earth, right? A little bit, kind of? But it gets better even than that, because methane has carbon in it. It's a carbon and four hydrogen atoms all stuck together. And carbon is the basic, uh, the basic atom that we use for life. In fact, when we have a complex molecule with carbon in it, we call those organic molecules. They're not necessarily indicating life, but important for life, and life makes those kind of molecules. So it's not entirely ridiculous to wonder if there are little alien fishies swimming in the lakes of Titan. So how about that for, for something that's both as strange as it can be and yet somehow harkens back to Earth? So we're going to move on to another moon. This is Enceladus. Enceladus is much, much smaller than Titan. Enceladus is about oh, 500 kilometers across, the size of Colorado, say. Um, so not that big. And it's mostly made of water ice. In fact, it's one of the most reflective objects in the solar system because its surface is covered in water ice. And I say water ice because ammonia and methane, these other molecules can freeze as well. You can get different kinds of ices, but this is water ice like we have on Earth. And this is interesting right away because look, just like, you know, uh, Iapetus, this is covered in craters up here, but not down here. And that's weird because if the surface were super old, billions of years old, you'd expect it to be covered in craters. It's not, which means something repaved the surface. Now, I'm not talking about aliens, maybe, as far as, as, far as you know, um, but something strange going on. At the South Pole, the South Southern Hemisphere of Enceladus, are these stripes, which are called tiger stripes. And <laughs> when I first heard this term, I thought, well, yeah, they look like a tiger scratched the surface. And when, they mean tiger stripes, like the fur. I'm an astronomer, not a zoologist, so there you go. Um, and it turns out these are, in fact, cracks in the surface. What are cracks doing in the surface? Well, as, as Enceladus orbits Saturn, it's, it's sometimes a little bit closer, sometimes it's a little bit farther, not much, but a little bit. And gravity changes with distance. Sometimes when it's closer to Saturn, it feels more gravity. When it's farther away, it feels less. And this stretches and compresses the moon every orbit pushing it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. That creates a lot of friction in the interior. And, you know, friction is, if you rub your hands together, you warm them up when it's cold, right? Well, the friction in the interior of Enceladus has warmed it up quite a bit. How much? Well, we're looking at the sunlit side of Enceladus, but if we go back to the, around to the other side, the dark side, and look back towards the sun so we see it backlit, we see this. Ooh, what are these? Those are geysers. That is water erupting up from the surface through those cracks. Enceladus has an undersurface ocean of liquid water, and a lot of water. Uh, it's comparable to the amount of water, or at least the, it's comparable to the amount of water on Earth, something like that. This is uh, not exactly fresh water. It's got stuff in it, probably salts and other things. Um, but uh, as the gravity of Saturn sometimes stretches the moon or compresses it, those cracks open up a little bit and the water from under that surface can then seep its way up and the pressure shoots it right up into the sky. There's no atmosphere on this moon. It's got a, only a little bit of gravity. So this water then just goes, goes screaming out into space and this is what you see. And in fact, in the early 20th century, when planetary scientists were exploring this moon, the Cassini spacecraft flew through those plumes and detected heavy molecules that are likely to be organic. In other words, they're heavy molecules with carbon in them, which means that under the surface of Enceladus is liquid water, an energy source, the, the heat from the friction, and lots of interesting molecules that can get together and, and make friends and get jiggy with it, I suppose. Kids today are still saying that, right? I'm sure I'm not 10 years out of date with my lingo. Um, 
they can become more complex. And again, we have to wonder, are there alien fishies swimming under the surface of, of this, uh, this moon of Saturn? Yep. Try that. Here we go. So we're going to move on to another moon. Uh, if any of you are fans of ancient movies, you may have heard of this one called Star Wars. If this one, if this looks familiar, this is the moon Mimas. It's about 400 kilometers across. It's not terribly big, but it has this honking huge crater on it called Herschel. Something smacked Mimas really hard. An asteroid, comet, uh, something like that hit it really hard. And it's interesting because the, moon, the, the crater on Iapetus that I showed you earlier, it also has one giant crater on it. And there are other moons of Saturn that also have one giant crater on it. What's weird is you don't typically see bigger craters. And the reason you don't is because if whatever had hit Mimas had been a little bit bigger or had been moving a little bit faster, it would have shattered this moon, it would have destroyed it. And so you don't see craters any bigger than this because if there were craters bigger than this, there wouldn't be a moon there to have a crater on. So you don't get them that much bigger than this. And in fact, it's possible that in the past, um, uh, objects like Mimas have been hit by bigger or faster objects. They have shattered, but they haven't exploded. They basically just kind of expand a little bit. The debris expands, but then its gravity pulls it back together. And then what you wind up getting is sort of this loosely packed object, a moon. And we see uh, objects like that, asteroids. Uh, a lot of them look like that. They're like bags of rocks. We call them rubble piles, honestly. And there are other moons around Saturn that look like this as well. They have very low density despite being made of ice. And we think they may, that may be because they're like shattered in place. And so there's lots of, lots of cracks in them and spaces between the rocks. And again, here you can see saturated in craters, just covered in them, which is what you expect for an old object that's been sitting out in space for a long time. Now, Mimas is the innermost of Saturn's large moons. After this, what we're going to get to are what makes Saturn Saturn, and that's its rings. The rings were seen by Galileo. Um, you know Galileo was not the, did not invent the telescope. You probably know that. You may not know that he wasn't the first person to even use one to look at the sky. He just was super good at self-publicizing his stuff and going out and telling people about it. And, and that's why we think of him a lot when we see that. But he did actually see the rings, and as telescopes got better... Uh, the astronomers in the 17th and 18th centuries could see that the rings weren't, not only weren't solid, there was more than just one ring. There was this ring, which they called the A ring, and this brighter one inside of it, they called the B ring. They named them in order of discovery. Fainter one in here, the C ring, and there's the D ring in here. Then there's way out here, there's like an E ring and an F ring and a G ring. Um, and so there, it's all mixed up because, like I said, these, these other ones weren't discovered until much later, so they were given later uh, letter designations after these. So it's all mixed up. But the three main ones are easy to remember. And you can see that there's a gap in the rings here. This is called the Cassini division, named after the astronomer who discovered it. And um, there are some rings in it, not many. And you can see that there are hundreds, if not thousands, of individual ringlets inside of these rings. What's causing all of this? Well, one thing that's causing it is gravity. The moon Mimas, for example, if you're a ring particle and you're orbiting, and Saturn would be over here off the right, if you're a ring particle orbiting in this gap, you orbit Saturn twice for every one time Mimas goes around. So to you, as you're going around Saturn, every time you go around twice, you see Saturn this way and Mimas this way, and you wind up getting pulled a little bit towards Mimas. And then you go around twice again, and there, there's that same lineup again, and you wind up getting pulled towards Mimas a little bit. Mimas' gravity is sort of tugging on these particles. It's very similar to if you're on a swing back on Earth, and you want to get up higher, what do you do? Well, you pump your legs, right? You're, you're putting energy into, into that swing. And you do it at the same spot over and over again, rhythmically, and that gives you more energy, and you swing higher and higher. Basically the same thing going on here. So Mimas' gravity, even though Mimas is like way off to the side here, it's pulling those particles out of the ring because it's a simple fraction of its orbit, two to one. And it turns out there are other fractions, three to two and five to four and all these sorts of things that can pull those ring particles out the same way. We call those a resonance. And that's why you get all these gaps in the rings. Except, except for one, maybe more, but there's one I want to point out. At the edge of the A ring, 
there's this gap, which is called the Enki Gap. It's, I'm not sure how big it is, but it's, it's fairly large. But then over here on the left, this is the edge of the A ring here, there's this gap. This gap's only about 40 kilometers wide, 20 something miles wide, very narrow. Um, but there's nothing in it, and it's not in a resonance with any of the moons. And astronomers thought, you know what? There could be a moon in that gap that is basically plowing its way through all, this, all these ring particles and sucking them up, and that's why there's no, uh, there's no actual particles there. And it turns out they were right. Here's another shot of that gap. And wait, what's this? These are little scalloping edges here, like little ripples in it. The sun was very low in this picture, so you can see the shadows of these ripples as well. And then there's this thing, which is not a spike going up, but is a shadow of a moon, which they named Daphnis. And when you get close to it, it looks like this. Neat! It's a space pecan. Or do you say pecan up here? Are you fancy or are you southern? I'm southern. I'm, I'm, I'm pecan. Uh, although, I know, you can get in arguments about this. Like, the, is the dress gold and black or red and blue or whatever the heck the dress was? Is that too old of a reference now? Am I still, like, stuck in the early 2020s? Okay. So this, this is a sort of a, sh you're seeing this at sort of a, f a shallow angle. So this is about 40 kilometers. This moon, it turns out, is only about 8 kilometers, so 5 miles long. And it is orbiting Saturn in this gap, and it's causing this sculpting. What's happening here is a little complicated, but I'm going to do my best here to, to briefly describe it. And that is, the closer you are to Saturn, the faster you're moving. Now, if you're, say, on a highway and you're driving at 100 kilometers an hour, and some car passes you at 101 kilometers an hour, if you're standing on the side of the road, right, you're going to see those two cars zipping past you. But to you, that other car is going to move past you at one kilometer an hour. That's slower than walking speed. Speed's all relative. So these things are all going around Saturn at very similar, but not quite exactly the same speeds. If you're on the inside edge of this gap here, this, say Saturn's down here, you're going to move faster than Daphnis by a little bit. And Daphnis orbits Saturn at a slight tilt. Not much, but just a little bit tilting. So it comes just above the rings at one half of its orbit and just below at the other half. So if it's up above the plane of the rings and you're a particle catching up to it here and passing it, you're going to get pulled up. And then it, 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 but it's very, very slow effect because you're approaching it very slowly. And if Daphnis is up here, you get pulled up. But over time, Daphnis is moving back down over its orbit. And so you feel a pull back down and that ripple dies down. And then this one was the, this is the one forming now. This was the last ripple that formed. And you can, you, you wind up getting these ripples that move down uh, in the direction that the particles orbit. But if you're on the other side of Daphnis, you're moving slower than Daphnis. It's catching up to you and pulling you up and down. And so you see the ripples start in the trailing part of it. Here the ripples are leading back here. You can't really see them here, but you can if you take a slightly different look, like here. Neat. So here, there's Saturn, right? So these guys are moving faster, and as they pass Daphnis, they get pulled up and down and up and down and up and down. And th so the current ripple that it's pulling up is right here. This is the last one, the last one going back. Here, though, the ripples start behind Daphnis because, they're, because Daphnis is moving in faster than them, and you get this weird sort of I don't know, ravioli edge to the rings there. And that's what's causing the scalloping. If you see that from a slightly different angle, like if you were close in to Daphnis, you would see these ripples and how, how they're moving ahead of you in the orbit like that. And if you were to get above the rings a little bit and look down on Daphnis, that's what it would look like. So these, these are going ahead of you. These are coming in behind you. Uh, that's one of the weirdest things I've ever heard of in the solar system. And yet... In a way, it's expected. If you have a moon that does this, you can easily predict that this is what's going to happen. But it doesn't mean you would think of this in advance until you see it. And it wasn't until uh, those ripples were first seen by astronomers, and they said, you know, there could be a moon in there and orbiting in a slight tilt and all this stuff going faster and slower and getting the ripples. And it turns out they were right. So that's kind of an amazing view. And then, 
Ah. What do the rings look like, though, if you're in them? They look like this. The rings are not solid, not even close. They're made up of countless chunks of nearly pure water ice. A little bit of, little bit of dust and other stuff mixed up in there, but they're mostly made of ice. And they're small. Over time, they've collided with each other at really pretty slow speeds and, cr and basically bumped into each other and collided and, and, and smashed each other into bits until the biggest ones are probably not that much bigger than, say, a car, something a few meters across. And there are, you know, how many of them in a, in a system that is 270,000 kilometers across? It's huge. So there's just trillions and trillions and trillions of them. And they're smooth because of all these slow speed collisions, like a rock tumbler. Any, any sharp edge would eventually get smoothed down because it's be being sandblasted by all of these other things bumping into them. This is what the rings look like. You don't really want to travel through them. Uh, you know, if you, you're, you're driving along in a car, you don't want to get into a sandstorm. It's going gonna, it's gonna to screw up your paint job and hurt your windows. If you're in a spaceship and you're moving much, much faster, it would be a lot more dangerous. Um, but this would be a lovely view, and that's what the rings look like from the inside. However, now let's travel up and above the rings and look down on Saturn. And this is a view you cannot get from Earth. Earth and Saturn orbit in the same plane around the sun. So if you see the solar system from the side, all the planets are pretty much orbiting in that same plane. So they would, they, 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 the solar system looks fairly flat. Here we're out of that plane looking down on Saturn, and you can see the shadow of the planet on the rings. The sun's way over here, a billion kilometers away, six, seven hundred million miles away, shining down on Saturn here, and that's the night side of Saturn, and this shadow here stretching off. Now what's weird is that that's the night side of Saturn, but you can still see it. Why? Well, if you go out at night on Earth when the moon is full, it's bright enough to read by. You can see easily. It's brighter than it is in this, in this theater right now. And that's because the moon is still sitting out in full sunlight, reflecting that light on Earth, and it's acting like a, like a spotlight on the planet to light it up. The same thing is happening on Saturn, but what's lighting it up are the rings. Uh, this is called ring shine. And if you were on the night side of Saturn, these rings would be so bright that you could read by them. They'd be very, much brighter, actually, than the, than the moon is uh, all put together. Now, we're going to fly over the north pole of Saturn here in a second, and you can see this oddly shaped, dim, sort of faded structure there. As we fly over it, though, we're going to get a better view, and that's going to look like this. Holy mackerel! That's, that's strange. That is an almost perfect hexagon, an almost perfect regular hexagon. This is, of course, built by the aliens that inhabit Saturn. Um, wait, no, that's not right. Um, it turns out that when you have a rapidly rotating object made of gas, these gases can flow past each other, and they start to do weird things that you may not expect. And one of them is that they just naturally form geometric shapes. We have something like that on Earth, uh, the jet stream, um, and, and it, it, it forms what are called Rossby waves. I won't go into detail. It's a complicated physics thing. But you just very naturally wind up getting these sorts of patterns. We see them on Jupiter as well. Uh, there's a hint that they may be happening on Neptune too. Um, but in this case, because Saturn you, you has very fast winds, there's a lot of shear here moving at different speeds. They wind up forming this colossal shape. Mind you, from here to here, this edge is comfortably bigger than Earth. The Earth would be about this big. So we're talking about an immense structure here. And then right in the center is this uh, permanent vortex, a cyclone, that's been there for who knows how long. Uh, but it, it's, it's just sitting there at the, at the North Pole of Saturn. And all of these are like little storm systems, pop-up thunderstorms and things like that inside of this, this gigantic structure. Um, I still see a lot of websites talking about how this is clearly evidence that Saturn was built or there are aliens living there or whatever. It's like, no. You know, don't jump to that conclusion before you've exhausted, you know, physics. And it turns out that's what it is. Now, we're going to sail over to the night side of Saturn and down above its cloud tops. Saturn is a gas giant. Uh, it probably has a solid core that may be slightly bigger than Earth, but the atmosphere itself basically starts there and moves outward and, be, and, and um, is thinner with height. So if you tried to go in 
you would just get into denser and denser atmosphere, denser and denser, and it would sort of merge into a liquid and then become solid. But it does have cloud tops, and you can, ser- you can skim above the cloud tops and look up and see Saturn's rings lit up by the sun. And as we move, move even more onto the sunset side, oh, there's part of our spaceship here, that's kind of cool. Um, the clouds turn red for the same reason they turn red at sunset on Earth. Uh, the, the atmosphere tends to uh, scatter away the blue light, only leaving the red to come through. The rings come out a little bit brighter. And then if we go fully onto the midnight side of Saturn, the rings are lit up beautifully. And look at that, there's the shadow of the planet on the rings. Now remember, Saturn rotates in 10 hours or less, something like that. So if you just wait a couple of hours, you can actually see that shadow move. And a couple of hours later, it might look like this. Now the shadow's over here, and you can see the tip of the planet there and the shadow across there. This would be an amazing thing. You could actually get a dirigible, a zeppelin made of, say, hydrogen. It would have to be huge, but you could hang a gondola underneath it, and you heat it up, put, put air in it, and you can float above the cloud tops of Saturn and watch all this. Watch the moons move. Watch Saturn's shadow move across the rings. Um, that would be something like a honeymoon suite, and you can imagine what the cruise lines would charge for that. That would be very romantic, though. But now, we're on the dark side of Saturn, the night side, and we're going to fly away now, turn around, and look back at the planet. And that view is this spectacular shot of Saturn. Now, we're seeing the rings backlit from the sun. That circle of light around Saturn is actually... Uh, sunlight that's being bent by the upper atmosphere and uh, so that that light would normally pass right past us but the atmosphere is bending it a little bit toward us and so we see a ring of bright light around it and there's a f- you can even see a faint ring here outside of the a b and c rings all kinds of rings out here all kinds of structures and you can see eh, eh, some of these are moons some of them are stars and then there's this guy right here take a look at closer look at that Yeah, what is that? Here's something I've always wanted to say. Computer, enhance. Ah, here we go. That's Earth, okay? We're looking back towards the sun. The Earth orbits the sun at a tenth of the distance Saturn does. So from Saturn's point of view, Earth doesn't get very far from the sun. So it's actually pretty close in to to where the sun is in this picture. And that little bump right there, that's the moon. That's the Earth and the Moon from a billion kilometers away, from 600 million miles away, looking back. And to me, this is one of the most wonderful things about exploring Saturn. We have been to Saturn. We can go to Saturn. And when we do, we can turn around and see our own planet from halfway across the solar system. And with Saturn, it's so different than Earth. It's a gas giant. It's 10 times bigger. It spins twice as fast. Its atmosphere is hydrogen and helium, but it has moons like we do. It has moons that have similar conditions to Earth. Maybe not exactly. You know, the temperature would kill you instantly, and the poisonous gases would too. And there are other problems. Uh, But there are some similarities. There could be life on these moons. There are several other moons orbiting Saturn that are icy that have undersurface oceans like Enceladus does. All of these things are teaching us about Earth. Saturn is really far away, but learning about it, remember, remember com- uh, compare and contrast essays when you were in like middle school? And how, you know, I hated having to do those things, but it turns out that's science, that's what it is. We look at Saturn and we say the same physics is working on Saturn that it is on Earth, but it's working under different circumstances. It's a bigger planet, it's made of different stuff. It's got different moons. How does that all change? What do we know about the physics here that applies there? And then we learn about how the physics works, and then we can turn back around and apply it here on Earth. The climate system on Earth is is ridiculously complicated. We have this atmosphere that's heated by the sun, the Earth is spinning, and it causes all kinds of incredibly complex stuff that affects our climate. But by looking at other planets and seeing how they work, we can learn more about how our planet works. Astronomy is all about looking out into the universe, but at the exact same time, it's looking back at our home and learning more about it than we could possibly have known if we had stayed here and only looked out. And that is our tour of Saturn. I will say that the cruise company 
has asked me to plug their other cruises. They have uh, Pluto, the last sentinel of the solar system, the guardian of interstellar space. There's also a star cluster. Watch a million suns rise and a million sunsets in one night. You can go to a gas cloud and watch stars being born. Or if you choose, you can go to a black hole, the last vacation you will ever take. And you can read all about these in the book that was commissioned by the cruise line under Alien Skies by me. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, Phil Plate. And I wanted to mention that if you wanted to ask questions of our guest, he'll be in the JDW Theater as you exit the theater. It's the theater behind the big electrical devices. I'll have some staff to direct you over. He'll also be signing his book at 8.30, also in front of the JDW. Uh, if you do have tickets for the Bad Bunny show, you can stay in your seats and we'll collect them before we seat for that show. One final round of applause for our guest. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you.